and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I'm here with a very special guest who I really want to take the time to introduce you to, Rob Zins. Rob, great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. Good to be here again yes. with you. Now, a lot of people don't really know who you are, although I know I've known you for decades. But uh, just to let our YouTube viewers out there get a good idea who you are, I'd like you to take some time and explain the books you have written. Now, you are a former Roman Catholic, yet you graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. Right. In fact, I think your, uh, your degree is in history. Historical True. theology, right. Historical theology. So uh, with that said, and for the sake of our viewers who don't really know who you are, and there's going to be a lot of people like that, <laughs> I'd like you to kind of begin with some of the books you've written, some of the pamphlets, things that talk about your ministry, mm -hmm. maybe your website, and then I'll just throw in my two cents worth whenever I get a chance. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Larry. It's good to be here. Actually, after graduating from Dallas Seminary, it was my intention to go into the pastoral ministry and to become involved in local church work, which I think is probably what most of the uh, men who graduate from seminary want to do. But having been in the pastoral ministry for several years and, and having uh, come to some uh, idea through my studies about the great Protestant Reformation, I was concerned a little bit about the uh, disposition of evangelicals toward the Roman Catholic religion. Now, I was raised in the Roman Catholic religion and and, and went through catechism and confirmation and so forth. But uh, I, I left the Roman Catholic religion and was kind of free-floating and uh, ultimately came to Christ through reading the scriptures and, and having been witnessed to by some Christians uh, a little bit later on in life. And uh, after going to seminary and being a part of the pastoral ministry, I began to notice that there was a shift taking place in our nation that more and more evangelicals, more and more articles and books were written uh, favoring the Roman Catholic religion and sort of building this large tent and including not only Roman Catholicism but a number of other non-Christian religions under this tent. So I began looking around for books that may address this issue and there weren't too many books out there. And I came across one book in particular written in the early 50s by a man named Lorraine Bettner. And at that time, Dr. Bettner had written a standard work on the Roman Catholic religion, but it was outdated. And along about that same time, a Roman Catholic writer wrote a book, an apologetic book, wherein he set about to do what uh, the book says debunk Lorraine Bettner. In other words, to disprove all that Lorraine Bettner was saying about the Roman Catholic religion. You're so, talking about Carl Keating? Carl Keating, right. Mm -hmm. Carl Keating's book. So I read Keating's book uh, and, and read Bettner's book again, and I, I asked the question almost out loud, has anybody answered Keating? Now, he started Catholic Answers. He did. He started Catholic Answers in San Diego, and no one at that time had given a direct answer to Carl Keating. So I decided, well, Let's give it a try. And that's when I wrote my, uh, my very first book. And this book is entitled Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a long title, Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's a purposeful title. This book goes through every single chapter of Carl Keating's work and analyzes the Roman Catholic position on virtually every aspect of their religion. We have in this book a chapter on baptism, penance, purgatory, the Eucharist, the Mass, the place of Peter invoking the dead, Mary, justification, the so-called charge of professional anti-Catholics, and a final chapter on the changing face of Rome due to Vatican II. So this book was written in response to a very strong Roman Catholic writer. Mm -hmm. And that actually began the ball rolling to have a, a more full-orbed, ongoing ministry to the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. community. But, as you know, in 1994, a statement came out called ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, where a number of prominent evangelicals actually signed a document essentially endorsing the Roman Catholic religion. This document came as quite a shock to the evangelical community. It still has a rippling effect to our day, 
And I think I, it was signed by like Bill Bright of Bill Campus Bright, Crusade, Campus Crusade uh, J.I. Packer, uh, J.I. Packer, uh, um, a number of people. And that led me to write my second book. My second book is entitled On the Edge of Apostasy, subtitled The Evangelical Romance with Rome. This book is extremely important because we analyze the modern evangelical thought patterns of those who would want to convince us that the Roman Catholic religion is just another branch or form of Christianity. And uh, did a lot of research, it's well footnoted, and uh, I, I just spent a lot of time trying to answer the question, why would evangelicals ever think that the Roman Catholic religion is in fact a Christian religion and should be considered as an alternative worshiping community to Christianity? And having written this book, I got into all kinds of trouble because uh, it flies in the face of the modern uh, thinking mm -hmm. of ecumenism. Mm -hmm. So this deals with the ecumenical movement and a number of broad organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have it available for you on a number of okay, various websites. Uh, could you briefly mention a few of your other references before we... Yes, we realize that a lot of people don't like to read long books, so we've written <laughs> short books. And this booklet right here is a, a book that we've sent all over the world. It's entitled Salvation by Grace Through Faith Alone or by Grace Through Sacraments. And this is a very uh, concise analysis of the Roman Catholic sacramental system. And it's not too hard to read, it's not too long, it's direct, and we think we hit the point very well. But for those who like to read booklets, <laughs> we have written a tiny little booklet that we do send out a lot. It's called, I'm a Christian, you are a Roman Catholic, so what is the big deal? And this also has been translated into Spanish as well. And uh, I like to remind you that uh, we do send these booklets over to Spanish speaking nations and people. In fact, we made, a, we made a Spanish video out yeah. of that and it is yeah, on it. YouTube. Yeah, it the, is on the audio YouTube. is on YouTube. Right. So between the, the larger works, the medium works, and the smaller works, this is a sampling of the kinds of things that we use uh, to help Roman Catholics understand their own religion and also to help evangelicals understand the Roman Catholic religion. And in doing so, I think you'll, you'll have to agree at the end of the day that the Roman Catholic religion is a religion unto itself and uh, uses, in some cases, many Christian terms, but defines them with a completely non-Christian dictionary. That's the way well, I like to say it. I would like to mention also that uh, for those of you out there that uh, may not be familiar with our, uh, uh, our YouTube channel page, See Answers TV, you're seeing it right now on your screen. But uh, you may not have noticed that if you look at our channel page and you go down a little bit, on the page, you'll find that we list several websites, BibleQuery.org, MuslimHope.com, uh, HistoryCart.com, BereanBeacon.org, PilgrimPublications.com. And then there's one right under, after that called CWRC-RZ.org. Now, does that sound familiar to you, Rob? It certainly does. That's our website, uh, Larry, cwrc rz rz.org and if you come to our website and scroll through it there are tons of articles and information on how you can get these books and pamphlets and we'd uh, love to hear from you you can email me and uh, order anything you want off the website yeah, i'd also like to mention to our viewers that if you're on our channel page you'll notice we have 19 playlists that go down the right hand side of the page on all kinds of subjects third one down is on jehovah's witnesses and mormons and and uh, Seventh-day Adventists and so forth. But as you get way down in there, you, you find Roman Catholicism. As you're seeing on the screen, this is our playlist on Roman Catholicism. At the time we did this video, it was we had 79 videos. We've got more now But uh, by the time you're seeing this. But uh, as you're looking at this, uh, you see that we have... Uh, all these videos, and Rob is in quite a few of these videos. Mm. Rob, as the people are looking at this, they, they see here that uh, there's a Boston College debate. And what happened in that particular video, for instance? Well, the Boston College debate was a, a debate that uh, centered around the authority of the Pope at Rome. Essentially, it was our duty and, and privilege to debate two Roman Catholic scholars on stage at Boston College, and they presented the Roman Catholic uh, persuasion on the Pope at Rome, who's considered in their religion to be the vicar of Christ on earth, and 
we did everything we could to refute their understanding and also to present the, the biblical Christian understanding of the person of Peter. So that, that's the, the very kind of thing that we do, and we have it on videotape. And anybody who's interested in the difference between what a Roman Catholic scholar would present about their own religion and about the Pope at Rome, and the contrasting view, the antithetical view, actually the opposite view of biblical Christianity, that would be a good debate to watch. Right, and I wanted to mention on our playlist, we have our 16-hour video series with Rob and me that we did like 20 years ago. Right. Uh, but that covers uh, the, the whole orb of all the teachings and doctrines of the Roman Catholic religion. And then we've got all kinds of other videos that Rob and me have done as well. Your debate with the Monsignor, right. for instance, that was most interesting. He was basically saying you can believe anything yeah. and it doesn't really matter. I'm letting uh, everyone know that we have many, many videos. One last thing I want to say is if you type Rob Zins, that's R-O-B, Z-I-N-S, into the YouTube search box, you'll get a whole plethora of Rob Zinn videos that are available on YouTube. And if you were to type Rob Zinn's Romanism, once again, you'll get even more Rob Zinn's videos <laughs> in a plethora of uh, videos available. And as you can see these things, there's just some samples there on your screen. But uh, with that said, we just wanted to call your attention to all the resources that are available through this brother in Christ here, former Roman Catholic, who was saved by a supernatural act of God. That's really the difference in a real Christian who has been born again, John 3, 3 through 8, through a work of the, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit over just getting baptized or, or doing all these sacraments or things of that nature. We're talking about what makes you a real Christian is a supernatural act of God on your behalf where before you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Yeah. Behold, now you're alive in Christ. And that's really what changed your life. Amen. All right, okay. brother, with that said, uh, we're going to go into, this is just a promo leading into a main video. So uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, little information uh, situation for discussing Rob. And I uh, hope you enjoy the video to come. God bless you all. of the Catholic faith and we're very excited to to do a debate like this in the month of August because it is the month of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and I would like to introduce to you um, both debaters taking the Roman Catholic position is Jerry Matatix he comes all the way from uh, Scranton Pennsylvania he has a master's degree in biblical Greek and Hebrew he is an ABD, PhD at Westminster Theological Seminary. He's the president and founder of Biblical Foundations International, which is the biblical defense of the Catholic faith. He's a noted uh, speaker internationally and around the country. And again, he's taking the affirmative position. On my right side here is Mr. Robert Zins. He is a Protestant scholar. He has a Master's of Divinity degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. He's also a teaching elder of the Reformed Bible Church in Rutland, Vermont. He's the director of an organization, and probably the founder of the organization, a Christian witness to Roman Catholicism. He's also the author of uh, numerous books on evangelizing Catholics. I would like to uh, go over the format of the debate before I do that, though, I also want to mention that both debaters have come a long way. They've come all the way from the East Coast to defend the Protestant position and the Catholic position. And we would like to take a uh, free will offering during the debate for each of their travel expenses. In fact, Jerry Manitix felt that this 
this subject is so important to defend, so everyone knows the biblical basis of this subject, that he offered to pay for Robertson's expenses out here out of his own pocket. So we will be taking a free will offering for both debaters to cover their travel expenses. We're glad that they both took time out of their busy schedules. Uh, Mr. Robert Sims does a lot of traveling and a lot of lecturing. He was very busy and he took time out of his schedule to come out here. And Jerry Maddox took time out of his busy schedule also. The format of the debate will be, there will be a 30 minute opening statement. Jerry Maddox again taking the affirmative will go first followed by Mr. Robert Sins, he will make his 30 minute opening statement. Then after that we will go into phase two of the debate which will be the rebuttal section. And Jerry Maddox then will have 15 minutes to offer a rebuttal of Mr. Robert Zins' opening statement. And then in turn Mr. Robert Zins will have 15 minutes to offer a rebuttal of Jerry Maddox's opening statement. And then, with Jerry Maddox taking the affirmative position in a theological formal debate, it will then be Jerry Maddox's decision to either go to cross-examination or to continue with one more round of rebuttal. And Jerry will make that decision at that moment. From then, we will go to the third section of the debate, which will be 10 minutes. Each debater will give their closing statement. And then after that, we will go into a question and answer period. We will um, encourage, we'll, we will hand out some uh, index cards and some pens. So anyone who wants to answer, ask a question of either debater, we ask you to put their name, who you want to address the question to, and then in, in as short, of, as few words as possible, <laughs> the question you want to ask them. And then they will have to, They'll have two minutes to answer it, and then there'll be a two-minute rebuttal, and we'll alternate both of these. With that, uh, we will start the debate uh, for Jerry Manedick's opening statement. We will begin. I'd like to begin with a prayer, and I want the Protestants in the audience who are I know, I was a Protestant for 14 years. I know how sometimes things that Catholics say or do seem a little bizarre until we become accustomed to them and see the biblical basis of them. But I'm going to begin with a prayer. I hope you're not uh, unnecessarily offended by my making the sign of the cross, which is an ancient thing that Christians did all the way back to the very first century. And uh, we're going to ask the Lord's blessing upon this today this evening. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for every person that has come here this evening. We know that you are sovereign in history, that you work all things according to the counsel of your will. We know that you have a plan and a purpose for each person who's here. And we ask that we would come to know and fulfill that purpose. To the glory and honor of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want to thank everyone who's come this evening, uh, Protestant or Catholic. I want to thank uh, Vince Sheridan for serving as our moderator, and Mr. Sins for being willing to participate in this debate. We've debated before. We debated uh, Wednesday night back up in Tacoma, and there are tapes of that debate available back there. A debate on uh, Jesus, does he save by faith alone or by faith uh, and sacraments, and which does which the Bible teach? And I want to thank, as I said, each of you for coming as well. I stand before you tonight as a Bible-believing Christian. I am here to honor my Lord Jesus Christ by teaching the truth contained in sacred scripture, God's inspired, inerrant word in written form concerning his mother. And in honoring the mother, my ultimate goal is to honor the son. It is he who honored her first by choosing her to be his mother, and I simply seek to follow in his footsteps. And as I mentioned already, I stand squarely on sacred scripture. For the, I'm not going to tell my conversion story now. I did that in Vernonia uh, a couple of nights ago, Thursday night. And we have that tape available back there, how the Bible converted me to Catholicism. But for those of you who know a little bit about my background, I was an evangelical Protestant for 14 years and a very adamantly anti-Catholic one. And I was convinced that the, um, that the Bible does not back up what Catholics teach. And I want to show you one example of how I came to see the error of my ways. And I hope that Mr. Zins, by the grace of God, will come to see the error of his ways. And any who share his Protestant faith this evening will as well. And I say that in great love, because I want all of us, obviously, to be more biblical in what we believe. It is the Bible uh, that God has uh, given us to be his word in written form, and certainly what we 
what we say should be backed up by sacred scripture. Sorry? Hold, we have to hold the microphone, okay? Sorry, but not the microphone holder, okay? <laughs> I will do that. Um, I'm going to insist that my opponent tonight stick to the proposition being debated tonight, which has already been read to you. That is, does scripture support the fact that Mary was a virgin her entire life, before, during, and after uh, giving birth to our Lord? Or does it contradict it? And I want to hear from Mr. Zins tonight a biblical argument that demonstrates that Mary had relations with Joseph, her husband, and that she had other children as a result of those relations. I do not want to hear rhetoric tonight. Mr. Zins claims to be a Bible-believing Christian and that Scripture is his only rule of faith and practice, and I wanted to prove that out of the Bible. I heard plenty of rhetoric on Wednesday night at the Tacoma on our debate on the sacraments. Uh, I heard so much rhetoric against ritual, I thought, does this, has this man really thought deeply about what the Old Testament says? How could anyone who believes that God inspired the Old Testament and gave the people of God in the Old Covenant countless rituals to perform use ritual in a pejorative sense as a dirty word? So we want to stay away from rhetoric tonight, but on both sides, myself and Mr. Zins, we want to look at what the Bible has to say. And you are going to have to decide tonight whether the Bible backs up what the Catholic Church says or what Mr. Zins says this evening. I am, and for that very reason, going to do what I did on Wednesday night. I'm going to ask Mr. Zins to do the same. I'm going to raise my right hand to heaven as the angel does in the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, chapter 10, verse 6, and swear, as the, as the Bible itself says there, it says he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things which are in it, and the earth and the things which are in it, and the sea and the things which are in it. And I want to say that I stand before God, as God is my judge. I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I will teach what scripture says, and I publicly disavow, here and now, tonight, any reliance upon any traditions of men, <laughs> or upon any doctrines of demons, or on any influence whatsoever from Satan, who is the liar and the father of lies. I rely utterly and completely for my presentation tonight on the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to fill me and to speak the truth that he inspired and put in sacred scripture out of my mouth. And I insist that Mr. Zins take that same very biblical, very legitimate oath so that you know that he is putting himself at the, in the hands of God, will be our judge one day. Both of us will stand before him and give an account for what we say here tonight. We cannot, for the sake of winning a debate, twist the truth or falsely handle the word of God. God forbid that we care more about winning a debate than about being faithful to Almighty God, who has given us his word. Now, I said a few minutes ago that I'm here to honor our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore to obey him and to follow his example of honoring his mother as he did. Part of honoring the mother of the Savior is acknowledging that God did something stupendous in and through her, which we call the Incarnation, God himself becoming man. And the paradox, the, the wonder of the Incarnation, is that now there was a person who was two things that had never been true before of one and the same person. He was God and man. Up to, this, up to the point of the Incarnation, there had been God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost from all eternity. And there had been man. But before, before the Incarnation, there had never been anyone who was both in the same person. And now there was. And this was unique. Protestants and Catholics, at least conservative Protestants, agree on this. If they believe in the deity of Christ, as they should, although most Protestants have fallen terribly from that very important biblical teaching in our day. Now, God chose to become a man through a woman. He could have parachuted out of heaven as a full-grown, fully mature adult, but he didn't do that. Why? It's important. It's significant. God chose to become a man through a woman, to take his flesh, his human nature, from a woman. And God decreed from all eternity that the most appropriate way to do this was to make her a virgin mother. And the uniqueness of the one our Lord Jesus Christ, who was to be both God and man in one person. Two terms that up until then had been incompatible, mutually exclusive. You were either God or you were man, you were both. The uniqueness of this was to be mirrored in the woman that he was to be born from. For she too would be, for the first time, and the only time in human history, two things that never before had been simultaneously true of one person. She would be virgin, and she would be mother. 
There were virgins before Mary, the mother of our Lord, and there were mothers. But there was never, ever anyone who was both in the fullest, most literal, and most permanent sense of each of those words at the same time. So the one paradox, the God-man, our Lord Jesus Christ, found a parallel in a second paradox, the virgin mother. And just as from the very moment of the incarnation on, Jesus was both God and man forever, never ceasing to be both at, the, at one and the same time. So from that same moment, the conception of Jesus, our Lord, in Mary's womb, Mary was to be forever both virgin and mother at one and the same time, never ceasing to be the one or the other. Mary was set apart for a special vocation. God had selected her, as I said, and prepared her to be the vessel, the vehicle, that sacred gateway through which God himself would enter the stream of human history. And that gives her a special significance in God's plan of salvation. He consecrated her to that special task. And I think it's a failure to grasp the holiness of God and the way that God constantly, when he sets something apart for a special purpose, as he did, say, the Ark of the Covenant, or the Tabernacle, or the Temple, to think that after serving this special purpose, it could be put to some profane purpose, that is, to some ordinary, rather than extraordinary purpose, some natural, rather than a supernatural use, or motherhood, is to, to be blind to the whole way that biblical theology works and biblical faith works. So when God consecrated Mary, especially her body, to be the sacred gate through which God sent into the world, that consecration confers a specialness to it that God himself will not then detract from or diminish or take away. Now, I don't need to define for this group, I think, what virginity is. I think we all know what virginity is. It's a complete abstinence from any and all sexual relations. Virginity is a gift of God that we all receive, of course, at birth. It's not a virtue, but a moral uh, but a natural condition, rather, at, at birth, not a moral virtue, which can be relinquished at some point in our life, or even lost against our will, of course, which sometimes criminally happens. Virginity, in the Bible, of course, is not only a physical thing, it's also a spiritual and a, a moral thing. It's not only the integrity of the body, but the determination to preserve that integrity, either for a certain length of time, as in the case of those who understand biblical law, and say, I'm going to remain a virgin until I marry, premarital virginity, or perpetually, if someone lives a life of permanent celibacy, as our Lord did, our Lord Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul did, as many people have chosen to do it in obedience to our Lord's teaching in Matthew 19, that some make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God, uh, as Catholic priests and brothers and sisters do, that is, that is monks and nuns, and, and lay people as well sometimes, uh, and as Catholics believe the Bible teaches, our lady chose as well. So the Catholic Church teaches and has always taught that Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Jesus. I'm not going to spend any time on the first of those three points. Uh, that is, that Mary was a virgin in conceiving Jesus before she uh, conceived and gave birth to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'm grateful that Mr. Zins uh, accepts that part of the Catholic Church's teaching. As a conservative Protestant, he believes in the virginal conception of Jesus Christ, whereas you know, many Protestants no longer believe that today. Uh, even though that's a clear teaching of sacred scripture. So Mr. Zins agrees that Mary is spoken of in scripture as a virgin, at least insofar as her conceiving the Lord is concerned. He agrees that by the supernatural activity of God, she conceived our Lord and yet did not lose her virginity in conceiving him. She remained a virgin after her conceiving him. Now, if Mr. Zins is going to claim, as he needs to tonight to win the debate, that Mary did not remain a virgin her entire life, he needs to show us when how or by what she lost this virginity. He admits she starts out as a virgin. Now he needs to show us where she ceased to be a virgin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, cannot do. Does he believe she lost her virginity during the birth of Jesus? He has no proof of this. And I will show that scripture clearly teaches, definitively teaches otherwise, with the inspired and fallible testimony of the Holy Ghost himself. Does he believe that she lost her virginity after the birth of Jesus in having sexual relations with Joseph and having other children? He has no proof of this either. And I will show the scripture clearly teaches otherwise. In short, I will show you tonight that the perpetual virginity of Mary is scriptural. And that the denial of per perpetual virginity is not scriptural. has no biblical basis whatsoever. It is a tradition of men that has arisen even recently, even within 
the, the, the context of Protestantism. Because I'm going to show you that, in fact, the original Protestants, Martin Luther and John Calvin, all agreed with me, with the Catholic Church, that the Bible clearly teaches the perpetual virginity of Mary. So Mr. Zins is not only debating the Catholic Church tonight, he's debating all his Protestant forefathers as well at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And then secondly, I'm, so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to show you first positively for a few minutes here. The scriptures contain many indications of a perpetual virginity. And then I'm going to show you negatively that there's nothing in the Bible, as which Zins will seek to try to prove, that contradicts this perpetual virginity. Now, let's look at the positive then. Are there any positive indications in the Bible, Old and New Testament, because as Christians we accept both, that Mary was called to a life of virginity? There are several. First of all, Genesis 3.15. There we read that um, God says to the serpent, as he's executing the curses that sin has brought about into the world, I will put enmity, enmities between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, singular. She shall crush your head, while you lie in wait for her heel. What I'm focusing on here is the fact that God predicts that uh, he is going to bring about the seed of the woman. Now that is already a very, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, of course. That is a very astounding statement because in the Bible, the phrase the seed of the woman is an anomaly. It's, it's, it's a unique thing. I mean, seed is always associated with the man. It's the man who provides the seed that produces offspring. So to talk about the seed of the woman is already to say, hey, there's going to be no human father, no biological father involved in producing this seed of the woman who will bring about God's plan of salvation. But the, the phrase is also, so the expected phrase, seated the man, is not there, it's seated the woman, but also I want to point out that it's singular, as St. Paul himself says in Galatians 3. He says, and God did not say in seeds, plural, but seed, singular. So our Lord Jesus Christ is the unique seed, singular, of the woman, and she has no other seed other than he who is the Redeemer who is promised way back in Genesis 3.15, the first promise of salvation. We call it, in fact, the Proto-Evangelium. Genesis 3.15, the first preaching of the gospel, good news, that Satan will not win, that he will be defeated through Jesus and through Jesus' mother. Second thing I want to look at real quickly is Isaiah 7.14, which reads, you all know it, you, even if you don't read your Bible, you hear it every time Hundle's Messiah is sung at Christmas or Easter, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And he should be Emmanuel. That's his throne name, his divine name, to show that he is God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. Listen to that phrase, that solemn statement of sacred scripture inspired by God. Every word of it inspired and authoritative. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. How many people here are homeschoolers? I'm just curious, by the way. I don't know if you make your, I don't know if we homeschool our eight children. Uh, I don't know if you make your kids diagram sentences. I don't know if you went to public schools or Catholic schools you had to learn to diagram sentences. I hope you did, and I hope if you homeschool your kids, you do. If you take that sentence and diagram it, you have a compound predicate. In other words, you draw a line, and you put the subject on the line. Behold, a virgin. And then you make the rest of the sentence split into two lines. Shall conceive, and the conjunction is between the two lines, shall bear a son. One subject. Two verbs, two predicates. A virgin shall conceive, and a virgin shall bear a son. Shall give birth, the verb is, to a son. Now, can you see the significance of that? She's a virgin in the act of conceiving, and she remains a virgin in the act of giving birth to a son. She's a virgin even in the act of birth itself. In fact, the Hebrew is even stronger, because it literally says, not a virgin shall conceive, but it says, behold, the virgin conceiving and the virgin bearing a son. There's a participle there in each case that acts as an adjective de describing the noun virgin, Alma. So it's the conceiving virgin and the giving birth virgin, the bearing virgin. She remains a virgin, even in the act of giving birth. I'm sure you all understand the point I'm making here, okay? If I said, let me give an example, an analogy, just to make it clear. If I said, uh, Mr. Zins, uh, lost his Catholic faith and left the Catholic Church, we have a sentence with a compound um, predicate. Mr. Zins is the subject of both of those things. He lost his Catholic faith and 
he loves the Catholic Church. There's two separate actions that Mr. Sims uh, performed. And he's going to argue that he was justified, of course, in doing those things tonight. He was an ex-Catholic seminarian. But my point is that both of those things, we're not making one statement, we're making two statements, and each of them are, are true of the individual. That's the subject of the sentence, Mr. Zins. If I say Mr. Zins misunderstands his Bible and denies its teaching on Mary's perpetual virginity, then I'm saying two things about him. That he misunderstands his Bible and that he denies its clear teaching on the perpetual virginity of Mary. So that's what I mean here. But that's what God means here. A virgin will conceive and as a virgin she will give birth to a son. So we mean, and the church has believed this from the beginning, the church fathers elaborate on, on this miracle. That, the, that Christ left his mother's body in such a way as to do no violence to the seal of her virginity, to the intactness, the integrity of her body that a virgin possesses. God gave her the gift of virginity and did not wish to take it away from her in the act of giving birth. And so our Lord left his mother's body in the act of birth, just as his body left the tomb, for example, um, or into the upper room through the closed doors that we read about in St. John 20. When the angel rolls away the stone from the tomb, our Lord's already gone. He didn't roll away the stone, we know, as we read the scriptures in John 20, so that our Lord could say, thank you, I was waiting for you to you know, let me out so I could start walking around as a really good Lord. He passed right through the tomb without needing the stone rolled away. And likewise, he entered the closed room that the apostles were quivering in uh, without the doors having to be opened in John 20, 26. As light passes through glass without breaking it, the church fathers, uh, said, church doctors taught, so did the Lord pass through the body of his mother without breaking the seal of her virginity or rupturing um, that, I'm trying to be uh, discreet in the way I put it here, but you all understand what I'm saying, just rupturing that membrane that makes one an intact virgin. So Christ did not obviously come in the incarnation to take away anything of value by his incarnation, does he? He doesn't come. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came to give, to give life and life in abundance. So our Lord didn't come to take away anything that is good and valuable and fitting and holy in the incarnation, but to restore the incorruption of nature. It would not be fitting, therefore, that in his birth he would rob his mother of her virginity, which was a gift that she possessed from the beginning of her existence. He did not need to take away her virginity to be conceived by her, did he? So why would he need to take away his virginity her virginity from her, in order to be born of her. The same miraculous, supernatural God can do both. He can bring about motherhood and birth without robbing her of her virginity. Now, if you deny this, then you don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ. You don't. You might say, you say, I believe in the virgin birth of Christ. What you really mean is I believe in the virginal conception of Christ. But you don't believe in the virgin birth. If you don't believe what I just said, what the Bible teaches here in Isaiah 7.14. And that's something you want to think about. If you've been claiming all throughout your life that you're a Protestant, I believe in the virgin birth, but I think Mary lost her virginity when she gave birth to Jesus. By the way, the Apostles' Creed, even if you're not a Catholic, I hope you believe the Apostles' Creed, ladies and gentlemen, it's a basic statement of Christian truth going all the way back to the beginning of Christianity. It says that our Lord was conceived of the Holy Ghost, that's one thing, comma, born of the Virgin Mary. Have you ever thought about those words, ladies and gentlemen? He was conceived of the Holy Ghost, that's one thing. That's what many Protestants believe. But then they stop there. They don't really believe that he was born of a Virgin Mary, that she was a virgin in the act of giving birth to him. That's not simply a rep. The Apostles' Creed is very succinct and a very concise little statement. There's no needless repetition. So conceived of the Holy Ghost is one truth. Born of the Virgin Mary is another. It's not simply a second way of saying the same thing. So we're trying to fill up paper. Oh, what else can we put down here? Let's do a bunch of, get our Rochers with the source out. We'll just say the same thing three or four times. <laughs> The third thing I'd like to look at is uh, a couple of types, and I know that uh, I should probably come back to types later on. In fact, uh, what, I, what I'm going to do, uh, perhaps, is, is, is come back to these, um, but I'll mention them very briefly. Uh, a type in Isaiah 66, verse 7, talks about Mother Zion bringing forth without childbirth, uh, without the pain of normal childbirth. And the church fathers saw in Mary as the sort of the quintessential uh, perfection of what Israel was called to be. Israel was called to be a, m a mother. It's called to be, the Bible speaks there, of Mother Zion. And it's a representative of Israel. And of course, Israel had fallen. It had been derelict in its duty. It had not been that faithful spouse of the Lord that it was called to be. How has the faithful city become like a harlot? Isaiah would say of Jerusalem in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 1. But Mary, as that, as that remnant of Israel, that perfect one who had perfect faith in God and his promises we read in Luke chapter 1, she had that 
she, she represented Zion in its perfection, in its maternal perfection period. And so she brought forth our Lord again without the normal tearing and, and you know, uh, violation of virginal integrity that, uh, that other women do not because God is not intervening in a miraculous way. Another type I could look at, uh, this is my fourth Old Testament thing, I'll move to the new, is Ezekiel 44, verse 2. We have a vision here. Ezekiel sees a vision of a temple in heaven in Ezekiel 40 through 48. And this temple has many references. Christians of both persuasions, Protestant and Catholic, have, have seen. First of all, it refers to the church, obviously. The church, the Puritans talked about how this temple in heaven that Ezekiel sees is a vision of the New Testament church. The Bible speaks of the church as a temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16, you are the temple of God, and God's spirit lives among you. Secondly, it's a reference to each individual believer, in some sense, uh, because each of us is called to be a temple of the Holy Ghost. St. Paul says three chapters later in 1 Corinthians 6.18. It's also a type of the body of Jesus, our Lord. Remember, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Uh, in John chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, and that's why Ezekiel in 47, verse 1, says, I saw water flowing out of the right side of the temple. And St. John in St. John chapter 19 realizes when he sees the water flowing from the side of our Lord, pierced by the lance of Longinus, says, wow, this is, this is significant. This is the fulfillment of that Old Testament type, of course, because the body of Jesus is that temple. But clearly it's a type of Our Lady as well, of the mother of Jesus. Not every, ask, every detail of a type is fulfilled in every fulfillment. In some ways it's fulfilled in the church, in some ways in individuals, in some ways in Jesus. And, and each uh, fulfillment is, you know, perhaps has some of the details, but not all of them. But there's one interesting thing said about this temple that the church fathers saw as, as fulfilled in Mary. And that is in chapter 44, in Ezekiel 44, verse 2. We read that there is a gate that is sealed through which the Messiah, the Prince, will come out. But he will enter that, he will exit that gate without the seal being removed. And no man will enter by that sealed gate. And the church fathers say, wow, what a powerful prophecy that the mother of the Messiah, the gate through which he enters the world, will be sealed. He will not rip open the seal in coming into the world, nor will any man enter by that sealed gate. That is, there will be no you know, normal marital relations with her, even after that. And all the church fathers speak of this, who comment on this passage, say, this is clearly Mary, the mother of the Savior. St. Ambrose says, uh, what is this gate but Mary? And shut because she is a virgin. Five minutes left, okay. Mary, then, is the gate through which Christ came into this world when he was born by a virginal birth without losing the bars of her virginity. I'll quote the man that R.C. Sproul, a reformed, that is a Protestant, a Calvinistic theologian, uh, someone that Mr. Zins knows well, uh, and, and that I know as well, but I mean knows him, at least I don't know if he knows him personally, but knows him as a, one of the foremost reformed theologians uh, in the Protestant world today, R.C. Sproul said the greatest mind that has been produced in the 2,000-year history of Christianity in terms of a theological mind was St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, that's an interesting tribute from a Protestant. There's a whole book called Meet the Men and Women We Call Heroes, published by a Protestant publishing house edited by uh, Chuck Colton, if I remember properly, and the, the, they each get to pick their favorite Christian. And R.C. Sproul in his chapter says, I think Thomas Aquinas is the greatest theologian Christians have ever had. Here's what St. Thomas said in his Summa. In, uh, this is in uh, the... Uh, part 3, question 28, article 3. He says, quote, What means this closed gate, in Ezekiel 44, verse 2, in the house of the Lord, except that Mary is to be ever inviolate, that is, unviolated? What does it mean that no man shall pass through it, say that Joseph shall not know her, that is, have sexual relations with her? What does it mean uh, that the Lord alone enters in and goes out by it, except that the Holy Ghost shall impregnate her and that the Lord of angels shall be born of her? And what means this, that it shall be shut forevermore, but that Mary is a virgin before his birth, a virgin in his birth, and a virgin after his birth? And the Catholic Church has solemnly defined those things to be clear, incontestable teaching of Scripture, and dogmas, therefore, that are binding on the conscience of anyone who claims to be a Bible-believing Christian. Now, we've got to get to the New Testament. I've got less than five minutes left, so I'll have to continue this in a second period. But we see that this truth that already the Old Testament sets you up to believe. Remember, the Old Testament was given to prepare us for the revelation of the New. If you start with the New in isolation from the Old, you're going to miss the boat. You're going to miss the message. And this very truth that we've already seen the Old Testament prepares us for is taught from the very first day of our Lord's moral, mortal existence, the day of his incarnation, to the very last day of his mortal existence, the very day when he's dying upon the cross and looking out through, through his sweat and his blood and his pain and his agony in his hell, and sees his mother and testifies, as St. John 
19, that he is her only son, as we'll see when we get to that. The things I want to look at, uh, I'm just going to mention two because I've only got probably two or three minutes left, and, uh, and we'll do more. Um, first one is Luke chapter 1, verse 34, when the angel appears to Mary and says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among And And that he's, she's going to be the mother of the Messiah. And she asks the question, how can this happen? Since I do not know a man, that is, I have no relations with a man. Since I am a virgin, is how many translations put it. How can this come to be, since I am a virgin? Now, the angel had said, you will conceive, future tense. Mary's question makes no sense at all if she's merely saying that she had been a virgin up to that point in her life. The only impediment to a future pregnancy would be an ongoing virginity, a lifelong virginity. In other words, Mary knew, as any woman knows, how she can become a mother by ceasing to be a virgin. What Mary did not know, and could not know without a revelation from God, is how she could be a mother while remaining a virgin. In other words, if Mary had planned, she was already engaged, Joseph, when the angel appeared to her. She had said, well, we're going to get married, we're going to have normal sexual relations, and the angel says, you're going to have a son, he's going to do the sign. She would have said, okay, fine, What's, where's the problem? She wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been this conundrum, you see. It would have been obvious how she could fulfill the angel's words, words and become with child by having relations with Joseph. Her question only makes sense if she knew she was not going to have relations with Joseph because she was called to a life of perpetual virginity, which she had made as a vow of consecrated virginity to God. And her words make that clear. How could this be since I do not know man? It's not knowing man defines her. It describes her a way of life. If a prophet said to you, you will die of lung cancer, you know, and you said, how can this be since I do not smoke? You know, that would be a better, that would be a better analogy, you know, perhaps, than to, to what Our Lady said. Now, I said I would look at John 19, 26 as well, but I won't have time for it now since I just give my one-minute warning. And I'll simply say now that, that these positive indications are not something we put in one pan of the scale and we have, and we have negative indications to, to weigh against it. There is nothing in the Bible that contradicts the professional virginity of Mary. Mr. Sins is going to get up now, and I'm sure he will try to take you to the three big Protestant arguments. The one in Matthew 1.18 uh, and 25, which says that Joseph had no relations with her until she gave birth to her firstborn son. I will show you, ladies and gentlemen, when I get back up here, or Mr. Sins might even show you despite himself, that that verse does not, in fact, contradict the professional virginity of Mary. Secondly, the, the, only, the, only of the, the second argument is Luke 2, 7, that she brought forth her firstborn son. And many people think that means she had other children. And then the last one is the brothers of Jesus. And we will show that all, seconds, three these, all three of these arguments are no arguments at all. They have nothing to do uh, with contradicting the perpetual virginity of Mary. Thank you. Thank you. have a Bible here this evening, I would encourage you to open your Bibles up to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. This will be the keynote verse for my opening statement. Paul writes to Timothy these words, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And that's what we want to do here this evening. We want to be good workers, unashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. The New Catholic Catechism of the Roman Catholic religion states plainly for all to read the position of the Roman Catholic religion concerning the alleged perpetual virginity of Mary. And I quote, the deepening faith in the virginal motherhood led the church to confess 
Mary's real and perpetual virginity, even in the act of giving birth to the Son of God. Leave no room for doubt, the Catechism states the following. Mary remained a virgin in conceiving her son, a virgin in giving birth to him, a virgin in carrying him, a virgin in nursing him at her breast, always a virgin. So if Jerry wasn't clear enough, certainly the Roman Catholic Catechism is clear. The question for us to answer is whether Mary remained a virgin throughout her life. Is this the teaching of the Word of God? It is the right conclusion, after examining the biblical evidence, that Mary had a normal sexual relationship with her husband, Joseph, after giving birth to Jesus, and that she gave birth to other children as well. She did not remain a perpetual virgin. Let's examine the scriptures. They alone have authority and will determine for us an answer to this question. I think all of you in here should agree with me and hopefully Jerry that the Bible alone should be our source of authority on this issue. We read these words from the New Catholic Catechism. For Holy Mother Church relying on the faith of the apostolic age, accepts as sacred and canonical the books of the Old and the New Testaments, whole and entire, with all their parts, on the grounds that, written under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church herself. So we're going to find out if Mary remained a perpetual virgin before, during, and after she gave birth to Jesus Christ. Question number one. Did Mary, the mother of Jesus, make a vow of perpetual virginity? We begin with the Apostle Luke and his recording of the announcement that Mary, the betrothed virgin, to her soon-to-be husband, Joseph, would give birth to the Son of God. Now, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1 and read along with me, beginning in verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. From this passage, we learn that Mary was a virgin at the time of Gabriel's visit to her. We also learn that Mary, while a virgin, had been chosen by God to conceive in her womb the Son of God. We also <coughs> observe that Mary did not understand how she may be pregnant since she was a virgin at the time of the angel's announcement. How can this be, she asked, since I am a virgin. She is not bewildered as to how one might become pregnant. That is not her bewilderment. Her bewilderment is how can she be pregnant. Nor is she astonished that she is asked to disavow an alleged vow of virginity. 
The answer given by Gabriel is that the conception of Mary would be supernatural through the Holy Spirit who would come upon her. Mary is not so disgruntled at this point because she doesn't know how babies are made, and she is not disgruntled because she is worried that she has made a perpetual vow of virginity. That is nowhere found in the entirety of the Bible, a perpetual vow of virginity by Mary. Mary's question, how can this be, directs us to her understanding that she would conceive a child in the near future. She asks, how will this be, since a man I know not? Now the word here translated as no is the Greek term gnosko, and it is in the present tense. Mary does not say, how can this be, since I will not know a man? She says, how can this be, since I know not? a man. There is no pledge here to not know a man. There is only the simple perplexity that comes from wondering how this can be right now since a man I do not know and have not known. Gabriel's announcement to Mary is the equivalent of an angel appearing to you and announcing that you have found favor with God and you are now going to own AT&T, General Motors, IBM, and the state of Utah. The normal way of coming into ownership of such massive assets would be to buy them. But you are currently a little short of cash for such acquisitions. So you probably would ask, how can this be since I know not that kind of money? In saying this, you are not vowing to never buy property or to never have money. That's what my opponent would have you believe that Mary is saying this evening. Remember, Mary was considered to be the wife of Joseph. In some cases, sexual relations were permitted during the patrothal period. However, Joseph and Mary had decided to not consummate their marriage prior to this second stage of their marriage. But here, this is definitely the first stage in a two-stage marriage ceremony which was expected to be consummated by sexual relations. Would Joseph have married a woman who had pledged virginity for the rest of her life? We believe that he would not. And this will become more clear as we examine the biblical passage. <laughs> But before moving on to other biblical tests, we need to consider the following. Number one, there is no such thing in all of Scripture as a virgin making a vow of virginity and getting married at the same time. There is no such person, including Mary. Such a proposal would violate the, tier, the clear teaching of Scripture that a woman's body is not her own upon marrying into a marriage relationship. The Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes these words. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Thirdly, if someone wishes to remain a virgin in order to be devoted to the Lord, the advice of the apostle is to remain unmarried. It is not to declare a vow of virginity and then go off and get married. My opponent would have you believe that Mary had already made a vow of perpetual virginity before she got married and then went ahead and got married. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches just the opposite. Listen to the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. 
Does it make any sense to you that Mary would declare a vow of perpetual virginity and then go off and get married? Absolutely not. Not from the Apostle Paul. Not from the Word of God. It seems we are not alone in our assessment of Mary's alleged vow of virginity in this portion of Scripture. Well-respected Roman Catholic theologian Ludwig Ott states the following, quote, Holy Writ only indirectly attests the continuance of Mary's virginity after the birth. Only indirectly attests. That's a long ways from the Bible teaches it loudly and clearly. In response to the alleged vow of perpetual virginity, Ott has this to say. Remember, he's a Roman Catholic scholar. I'm quoting him. He says this, and I quote, In light of this text, St. Augustine and many fathers and theologians believed that Mary made a formal vow of virginity. However, the subsequent espousals can hardly be reconciled with this. That's not a Protestant scholar. That's a Roman Catholic scholar saying this. I agree with him. It's not in the Bible. never has been and never will be. In leaving this narrative, we notice that Mary went in haste to the home of Elizabeth and upon arriving was greeted by Elizabeth. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. This lends support to understanding that Mary's conception was immediate. That was the shocking news. No vow of perpetual virginity. No wondering how one gets pregnant. Here. Question number two. Did Joseph keep Mary a virgin after the birth of Jesus Christ? If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Could I have a show of hands of all those who brought their Bibles here this evening? Good, thank you. I appreciate that. Let's read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, put a little asterisk by that, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took her as his wife, and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, in this section of Scripture, Matthew informs us that though Joseph and Mary were betrothed, they had not yet come together. What does this word imply, this coming together word here? Well, so strong is the context in favor of coming together referring to sexual relations that Bauer and Gingrich, a Greek lexicon commonly used by both Christians and Roman Catholics, offers a separate category in the Greek lexicon expressing the very idea here that the word coming together refers to having sexual relations. But the main point that I want you to see is that Matthew is focusing on the virgin birth of Jesus. If before they came together references only living together then the force of the virgin birth loses its impact. It would not be any more significant for Mary to be found pregnant 
before they came together than after they came together if coming together only meant a perpetual virgin living platonically with one of her best friends. And that's the position of the Roman Catholic religion. She was found to be pregnant before they came together. But if before they came together means nothing more than living with a perpetual virgin, there's no impact in the passage. However, the more significant issue from this passage is the meaning of verse 25. If you have your Bibles, look at that. He, Joseph, kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. The main clause of this sentence is, he kept her a virgin. The issue is whether this action of keeping her a virgin continues after the birth of Jesus, or does this action change as signified by the word until. He kept, her he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to Jesus. Should it be like this? He kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and continued to keep her a virgin forever. This is the action of the main clause continuing after the word until. Or should it be like this? He kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and then had normal sexual relations with her. The action of the main clause stops after the word until is used. Well, let us look at other examples in the book of Matthew for the same construction. Matthew 13, 33. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. Then she stopped doing it. The action of the main clause stops with the until, and then there's no more action. Matthew 17, 9. And they were coming down from the mountain. Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Obviously, don't say a word until I've risen from the dead, and then you may say a word. The action of the main clause stops. Matthew 18, 34. And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should pay all that was owed. Well, obviously the torture doesn't continue after he repays, so until he pays... Then the torture ends. He's with the torture until he pays. It's a theme with Matthew to use this kind of language. And anybody reading the Bible fairly, I think, has to conclude and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Kept her a virgin until... She gave birth to the son. And then, of course, the implication is with the word until that there was normal sexual relations afterward. <coughs> Question number three. Did Jesus have literal biological brothers and sisters? Well, he did. And Mary was not a perpetual birth. We move now to a selection of Bible passages which state directly that Jesus had other brothers and sisters. If you have your Bibles open, again, turn to Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. While he was still speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. And someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside to speak to you. But he answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold my mother and my brothers. Matthew 13, 54. And coming to his hometown, he began teaching them in their synagogue so that they became astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph, Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get these things? 
All of our understanding of Jesus' family rests upon the meaning of the Greek term adelphos, brother, and adelphe, sister. Is there any reason in the Bible to understand these terms other than common uterine brothers and sisters? Are the ones called brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ really merely his near relatives, cousins, or spiritual brothers and sisters only? In the LXX, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word adelphos does have a wide range of semantical meaning. This is largely due to the fact that the Greek adelphos, brother, translates the Hebrew term ak. Ak is used for biological brothers as well as near kinsmen. It's a catch-all term in the Hebrew language. Hence, adelphos is used of sibling close relative, fellow man, ethnic countryman, and the like when the Hebrew term ah is translated into the Greek language. It can also be used in an allegorical relationship. For instance, in Genesis 14, 14, we read these words. And when Abram heard that his relative, and the Greek term here is Adelphos, had been taken captive, he let out his trained men born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. However, even though the word Adelphos is used with a wide semantical range in the Old Testament translation of the Hebrew text, we are quick to point out that Adelphos also refers to biological brothers and sisters. In fact, on most occasions where Adelphos is used in the Old Testament, it refers to normal sibling relationships. Genesis 4-2. And again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. That's a normal sibling relationship. Genesis 4-8. And Cain told Abel his brother. That's a normal sibling relationship. And the word Adelphos is used in both contexts. We could go on and on. In fact, the majority use of the term Adelphos in the Old Testament refers to biological brothers and sisters, normal siblings although it can be used in a broader semantical range. But what about the New Testament? Well, in the New Testament, Adelphos, brother, and Adelphe, sister, are used of biological siblings, countrymen, fellow man, and spiritual siblings. So it too has a broader semantical range than just biological brothers and sisters. However, there is no New Testament usage of either of these words as referring to relatives or cousins. In fact, these words are used in context with near relatives so as to distinguish the two. What's my point? My point is that when the New Testament uses Adelphos and Adelphe, it's referring to biological brothers and sisters or else spiritual brothers and sisters or else in another kind of metaphorical sense, but never is the term Adelphos or Adelphe used of a cousin or a near relative. Listen to this passage, Luke 14, verse 12. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brother or your relative or rich neighbor, lest they also invite you in return. Again, Luke 21, 16. But you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. The word for relative here is subgenus, and it is used in contrast to adelphos. What am I saying simply? I'm saying that when New Testament writers wanted to refer to near relatives, they used a near relative term. They want to refer to somebody as a cousin, they used the term for cousin. They didn't resort to the term Adelphos. Adelphos was used exclusively for these other meanings, including predominantly uterine brothers, siblings, normal brother, 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 sister relationship. Also, the New Testament distinguishes between brother and cousin. My opponent will probably argue this evening that these brothers and sisters were cousins or near relatives. But that's not going to pass. 
There is a New Testament word for cousin, and it is used for cousin in the New Testament. The writers do not resort to the term Adelphos or Adelphe at all. And that would be found in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. It is important to note that every time Adelphos is used in the New Testament, where a brother is named, it is a biological sibling. If you can't follow the Adelphos brother, Adelphe sister argumentation, put this in your memory bank. Take it on board. Every single time Adelphos is used in the New Testament where a brother is named, it is a biological sibling. For instance, and walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Biological. Matthew 4, 21, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them biological brothers. Not near kinsmen, not relatives, but biological brothers. Matthew 13, 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? His brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Here is a biological brother relationship as distinguished by the New Testament pattern that every time a Delphos is used in the New Testament where a brother is named, it is a biological sibling. Finally, even though we have competition in the building next door, I want to make this point with you. The Roman Catholic community, as far as I can tell, as far as I can read, appears to be split on whether Jesus had biological siblings from Mary. You think this is an open and shut case even among yourselves. It is not. Eric Spenson, in his book, Who My Mother, quotes the following Roman Catholic scholars as holding to the full brother view. Raymond Brown, J.A. Fitzmaier, J. McKenzie, Rudolf Pesch. To my knowledge, these men have not been excommunicated. Now, some of you may say in the audience, well, you know, they should be. They need to be. They're not really Roman Catholic. But here's your dilemma. These people claim to be Roman Catholic scholars. And they claim the same position I'm holding. And your own religion has not chastised them, disciplined them, defrocked them, or excommunicated them whatsoever. These are Roman Catholics who have concluded that Mary did indeed have other children. We close with this portion, our presentation, by repeating again. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James? Joseph, Simon, and Judas aren't all his sisters with us. And after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed a few days. Jesus' brothers said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. There's no reason to call these anything other than his biological brothers Ten seconds. and sisters. I thank you for your time. Well, I am really glad that move, that music started up because I have never seen someone dance around a clear meaning of so many passages of sacred scripture, and I think music was an appropriate accompaniment. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, that he did not take the oath that I did and that I asked him to. He can certainly not claim on the basis of scripture that to do so would involve any kind of sin or compromise of his Christian conscience or integrity because we see an angel taking the oath in... Uh, the book of Revelation, and hardly is he going to claim that an angel is committing a sinful action. And in fact, as I mentioned on Wednesday, most commentators believe that is our Lord himself that he's referring to. We need to look at the scriptures. We need to stand on the scriptures. And in fact, Mr. Zins asked how many people um, brought their Bibles. Every single flyer that I had ever sent out throughout my entire 
uh, ministry of Biblical Foundations always says, bring your Bibles, your questions, your pastors and friends. So I, I, I have nothing to fear from a very careful scrutiny of what the Bible has to say. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm further very grateful that Mr. Zins began by quoting 2 Timothy 2, 15 and following, which says that we should show ourselves, oh, thank you, show ourselves to be approved to God, to be workmen that should not be ashamed, to rightly handle the word of truth. If we don't do this, then we will fall into, he says, profane and vain speeches that will grow much towards impiety. I was astounded to hear Mr. Zinn's claim that that in the Bible, uh, it was permissible in some situations for sexual relations to take place before marriage. I, I don't even want to begin to think what sort of reasoning would try to produce justification in the Bible for that. The Bible is very clearly, ladies and gentlemen, I want to set the record straight, that sexual relations before marriage is fornication and is a mortal sin. And please don't come away from this debate thinking that uh, the Bible allows that before marriage. That is absolutely false, and I would like Mr. Zins to give us his evidence for that when he gets back up here to the pulpit, or retract the statement. There's an example of not handling the Word of God, and as a result, slipping towards impiety. In fact, the, this very passage that he quoted goes on to talk about those who once had the faith, and have strayed from the faith, and begin to subvert the faith of others. It mentions Hymenaeus and Philetus in verses 17 and 18. Let's look at those three passages, those three arguments that Mr. Zins wanted to use to deny what we already saw the Old Testament sets us up to expect and the New Testament supports. Whoops. Let's look first of all at Luke chapter 1. Mr. Zins took us there first. And he said that in Luke chapter 1, and again I have to say with all due respect to him that he misunderstood and misrepresented a lot of what was going on in the passage and even things that I said. He said, there's nothing here, there's no wondering on the part of Mary about how babies are conceived. That's the very thing that I said, that Mary's perplexity was not, how can I become a mother while ceasing to be a virgin? She understood how that can happen. But how can I become a mother while remaining a virgin? The angel appeared to her and said, you will conceive, you will give birth in the future. And if Mr. Zins is right that the force of the present tense in Luke 134, which says, how can this be, since I am a virgin, simply means I'm a virgin at this very moment, the statement remains meaningless. Mr. Zins has to wrestle with that. In other words, a woman who's a virgin at the moment that the angel appears to her, if an angel appeared to you and you're a virgin, and he says to you, you in the future, because he uses the future tense, you will conceive, you will give birth. And you say, well, but I'm a virgin right now. Where's the problem? You will, she knows she's engaged. She knows she's going to be married to Joseph. And therefore, her, uh, her last question would be, well, okay, I guess I'm going to conceive with relations with Joseph, according to Mr. Zins, in the future. And at that point, I will cease to be a virgin. But that is not what Mary is saying. She's not just saying I'm a virgin at this moment. Of course she was. She was a betrothed woman. And contrary to what Mr. Zins would seek to insinuate, Betrothed men and women did not think they had the freedom to engage in sexual intercourse before marriage. She knows her that the wedding ceremony is in the future. So her statement that I'm a, I'm a virgin right now would not be would not pose an obstacle. No, what she is saying, Mr. Zins is ignoring the fact, I hope he's ignoring it, I hope he's not deliberately suppressing it, that in the Bible, the present tense in the Greek doesn't always just mean something right now in the present. In fact, there's another verse for that. There's another tense for that that's very useful, and that's the aorist tense. The present often has, not always, but often has the, the force of an ongoing action. That is, it's what's called the present progressive tense. When Jesus says, whoever believes in me will never hunger, you know, and sin, and will never thirst. He doesn't just mean believe right now at this instant. That would be the aorist tense. But he means goes on believing, believes as a characteristic of their life. Now, I'm not going to argue, as Mr. Zins might want me to, because it would be as fallacious as some of the grammatical arguments he's made, which I'm going to skewer him for here in a minute, that because she's the present tense here, she had to mean this ongoing life. I'm not saying that. I'm simply I'm being, I'm making a modest claim. And I'm simply setting the record straight grammatically here that the present tense does not mean necessarily, well, I'm just a virgin at this moment, but I could, I could lose my virginity you know, the next minute by running over and finding Joseph, to whom I'm still betrothed, and having sexual relations with him. No. 
I am a virgin can mean, in Greek grammar, I am, that's my life, that's my vocation. It can have that ongoing, progressive, characteristic sense to it. I'm not claiming that it does. I'm simply saying you have to be open to the possibility. And then you have to look at the context. Which of these two meanings would make better sense? When Mary said, I am a virgin, does she mean I am right now, but I could lose it tomorrow? Then she would understand how she could become a mother. It's more logical, it is more reasonable, otherwise there's no point in asking the question that she means I am a virgin by calling. Okay? I'll come back to that point, by the way, in a moment, because or I'll come to it right now. Because Mr. Zins also misrepresented something else in Catholic teaching here. He quoted Ludwig Ott, who said that the Bible only indirectly attests to her ongoing uh, perpetual virginity. Of course, the Catholic Church has never claimed because the Catholic Church does not believe, what Mr. Zins believes, and we'll be discussing and debating this tomorrow, that everything that Jesus taught, that the Apostles taught, every fact in our Lord's life, every fact in Our Lady's life, every fact in the Apostles' life, is recorded in sacred scripture. Some of it is. Some of it was taught by them orally. And we're going to see in the debate tomorrow in Eugene that the doctrine of sola scriptura, that it's all got to be directly attested in scripture, is nowhere taught in scripture itself. That's another debate. So Ludwig Ott's admission it's the admission that the church has always made that I made. I grant, grant you the fact that the Bible only indirectly attests to something. But Mr. Zins, the Bible is God's inspired and fallible word. And whether it directly teaches me something, or it indirectly teaches me something, as a Christian, as a Bible-believing Christian, I'm going to believe everything the Bible attests. And simply putting the adverb indirectly in front of the verb attest is not going to make me say, well then, I guess I don't have to believe it. I only have to believe what it directly attests. The true spirit of the Christian is to believe everything the Bible says, whether it explicitly says it, implicitly says it, commands it, suggests it, that's the mark of the child of God. Ludwig Ott also says, he quoted him as saying that there is no evidence here for a perpetual vow of Mary. The Catholic Church has never taught and dogmatically defined that you must believe that she took a perpetual vow. All that you are required to believe as a Catholic is that Mary was a virgin before conceiving Jesus, in the act of giving birth, and after that she remained a virgin her entire life. Whether she did this because of a vow that she took as a young girl or whatever, that is a theory, that is an inference that these church fathers that Bob refers to derived from the text. They thought, well, if she's saying, I'm a virgin, she must have made some sort of decision to be, to remain a virgin her entire life. She must have made a vow to God. But the church has never defined that she took such a vow. It was only defined that whether it was because of a vow or, or just the way that her life continued, she remained a perpetual virgin. And it is a misrepresentation of Ludwig Ott to quote part of what he says in his final months of Catholic dog, where he says, you know, there's not enough evidence here that she took a vow to insinuate or imply or suggest that Ludwig Ott is in any way undermining the teaching of the Catholic Church that she was a virgin. Ludwig Ott says nothing, and you know, I encourage you to read it for yourself. You can get it. It's kept in print by Tan. Nothing to suggest that Mary was not a virgin her entire life. He quotes the dogmatic definition, and he says, this is what Catholics believe, period, end of discussion. Why she was a virgin, that is a secondary matter. But that she was a virgin her entire life, there is no question in Ludwig Ott's mind or the mind of any other Catholic theologian who operates with fidelity to the constant teaching of the magisterium, that's the teaching office of the Catholic Church. We'll come back to those people that he quoted the end of this thing later on. Um, so there's nothing here in St. Luke chapter 1 to contradict uh, what we saw when we looked at it ourselves and what the other passages of the Bible we saw looked at. Uh, I, before I move on to Matthew chapter 1, I have to say that Mr. Zins's argument that Joseph was called to be her husband and for they had to have relations, I think, really misses a lot of the very important teaching of the Bible about marriage. Mr. Zins quoted St. Paul in Corinthians, saying that the husband has authority over his wife's body, and she over hers. Absolutely. But I think it would be a very superficial view of authority to say that because a husband has rights, we talk about the marital rights in Catholic theology, we're very big on that, has rights to his wife's body, that he would always exercise his rights. A man can choose, a woman can choose, to voluntarily not exercise a right that is due them. And that is exactly what occurred in the case of Joseph and Mary. If my, I have a right to my wife's body because of our marriage, she has a right to mine. But if I were racked with pain and some, you know, uh, painful sickness, for example, or my wife were, I would be, you know, it, it would be not a very deeply biblical 
husband would say, well, I've got rights, and so by golly, you can infer the fact that I am definitely exercising my rights and I'm having relations with my wife, even if there might be some overriding reason not to do so. The fact is that although marriage provides those rights and bestows those rights, those rights can choose voluntarily. Uh, to begin, everyone has a right uh, to, to that type of um, relationship within marriage. But there are many situations and many seasons in a marriage in which those rights are lovingly and voluntarily uh, relinquished. Uh, Mr. Zins should know that from the Bible. So he seems to imply that Mary had, would have no reason for getting married other than to want to have sex with St. Joseph, which is a very, very unbiblical view of marriage, ladies and gentlemen. There are many reasons for St. Joseph and Our Lady getting married so that she would not have the scandal of being a un, an unwed mother in having this child, that she would have someone to provide for her, someone to protect her. And we see the role of Joseph right in St. Joseph, but this is not Catholic, you know, speculative theology. We see that Joseph protected her, brought them down into Egypt, that he supported them by his uh, work as a carpenter, so that Mary wouldn't have to be working, that she'd be able to raise her son. So there's many dimensions to a marriage, Mr. Sims, besides the exercise of sexual activity. And to say, well, as you said, that Mary had no reason to get married other than to have relations with her husband is, I think, a very dim view of marriage. You say that you quoted the statement that, uh, in first that she would have to please her husband. A, uh, a single person only has to please the Lord. A married person has to please their spouse. Absolutely. But there are many ways of pleasing our spouse, Mr. Zins, besides pleasing them sexually. And, uh, and, and the Bible talks about those other ways as well. Now let's look at uh, Matthew very quickly here, Matthew chapter 1. He said the impact would be lost if Joseph hadn't had relations after uh, the birth of Jesus because the statement is he had no relations with her until. Well, there's no impact if he didn't have it afterwards. Mr. Zins, Matthew is telling us when it became evident that Mary was pregnant. He's not interested in making an impact on us. He's simply saying before they came together, she was found to be with child. This happened before their marriage ceremony. He's simply stating a fact, Mr. Zins. He's not interested in, in trying to ascertain what impact you think the statement ought to have and then try to uh, you know, anticipate this 2,000 years ago and say, well, I'm going to use this language. The word until, Mr. Zins said, sometimes shows you that if something is true until point A, it then changes after that point. No argument. Every Catholic apologist, the Catholic Church, every church father admits that the word until Heos in Greek, av in Hebrew, even the word until in English, can sometimes mean a change. And he gave us examples of that. The woman you know, put the leaven into the, the dough until it was all leavened. Absolutely. We don't deny that, that the word until can sometimes mean that. All we're saying is the word until doesn't necessarily mean there's a change. And the Bible and common English language says that as well. We have, for example, the statements in the Bible uh, that uh, when, in which uh, the God the Father says to God the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110, verse 109 of the Dewey Reigns. That doesn't mean that after Christ conquers enemies, the Father will say, get out of my sight. I don't want you at my right hand anymore. He is there until this is achieved, and then he remains there. There are many other examples of this. We read that uh, Michal, King Saul's uh, daughter, who is David's wife, because she mocked at the Ark of the Covenant, had no children until the day of her death. Same Greek word in the Septuagint there, until. What did that mean? That she started having kids after she died? You know, posthumous pregnancies? No, not at all. So clearly there are plenty of places in the Bible where the, something is true until point A. It doesn't mean that, oh, by golly, it had to change after that. No, it remained true. We have many other examples. Paul saying to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13, pay attention to your reading, to exhortation, and to teaching until I come. Does he mean that once I arrive, I don't want you to, to be a student of the God's word anymore after that? Of course not. So the word until in Matthew 1, verses 18 and 25, has nothing. In fact, Mr. Zins, I can't believe he quoted Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich, standard Protestant lexicon. He only quoted part of it. He said, you know, there's a passage, there's a section there where they talk about how until is used to point to changes. But he didn't tell you the rest of the story, ladies and gentlemen, as Paul Harvey might say. That is, there's, they, they admit right there, and I will quote you from page 788, that quote, um, you know, he was talking about the statement before they came together, that was a sexual activity. Bauer and Gingrich says, quote, in the marriage contracts that we find from this period, the papyri, this Greek word, sunelthane, simply means to marry. So the statement here is, before they came together, he was found, she was found to be a child, can simply mean before they were married. And again, Matthew is simply telling us it became obvious, Mary began to show that she was pregnant before the wedding ceremony had taken place. And he was thinking, well, shall I go through with the wedding ceremony at this point? And the angel to tell him, don't worry, it's not because of any human. Ten uh, seconds. Father. 
we'll look at, uh, I wanted to get to uh, the Brothers of Jesus, but we will look at that uh, when I come up for my second uh, rebuttal period. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. And I'd like to let you know that free newsletters are available from our ministry. Just email us at cdebater at aol.com and give us your mailing address and we'll mail them out to you for free. You can also call us at 512-218-8022 and leave your address there. You can also access all our newsletters online by going to one of our three websites called BibleQuery.org. Once on the homepage, simply click on the Experience box and then scroll down to the newsletter section as shown here. Since our number one most watched video of the over 548 videos we have produced for YouTube at the time of this recording is... Unpopular Bible Doctrines Number 1, The Biblical God No One Wants to Know, with over 433,000 viewings, our latest newsletter is called Unpopular Topic, How Sovereign is God. Our second most viewed YouTube video is Six-Year-Old Wife of Muhammad Was Okay by the Muslim God Allah, But Not by the Biblical God of Jesus with over 341,000 viewings. We also have three newsletters available on Islam. Our video, Debate, Larry Wessels versus Two Jehovah's Witnesses at a University Study Center, currently has close to 150,000 views. See our newsletter on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceive Deceivers. Our video, Is Jesus God Almighty in the Flesh, meaning the second person of the Trinity, or is he something else, has over 101,000 viewings. See our newsletter, Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. Our video, Biography, the famous 19th century Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man of God, has close to 89,000 views. See two of our newsletters with lead articles from sermons by Spurgeon. Our video, UFOs, Ancient Aliens or Beings of the Fourth Dimension, number one, fact or fiction, has over 207,000 viewings. Not only do UFOs and the occult use the same disciplines such as levitation, teleportation of objects, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, automatic writing, and telepathy, but their theologies are completely foreign to biblical Christianity. UFO theologies include everything from reincarnation and evolution to man achieving cosmic godhood but they do not include Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We have two newsletters related to the world of the occult to which UFOs are a part. Our video, Former Roman Catholic Bride of Christ Nun Testifies of Abnormal Life in the Convent, has over 67,000 viewings. Our video featuring former Roman Catholic Rob Zins, who has a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, historical split between Roman Catholicism and the Christ of the Scripture, man's word or God's word, has over 53,000 viewings. 
see our two newsletters on the subject of Roman Catholicism. Our video, Cult of Ellen G. White, Number 1, Beginnings of the 19th Century Religion, called Seventh-day Adventism, has over 48,000 viewings and features former Seventh-day Adventist Wallace Slattery, who has 44 years' experience with this religion. Our playlist, called Dealing with Seventh-day Adventism and Their Prophetess, features 15 videos with 14 hours of material. See our newsletter, Seventh-day Adventism, True or False. For theological music lovers, see our video, Favorite Old-Time Christian Bluegrass Gospel Music, Psalm 98, verses 4 and 5, with over 214,000 viewings. We have also posted several music videos by my own daughter, Marlena Wessels, from her CD, Win This Fight, songs she has written and performed herself. To see our music videos, please go to our main YouTube channel page. Scroll down to our multiple playlists. Arrow over to our playlist called Our Radio Shows with National Christian Authors and Music Vids. Once there, scroll down to the bottom of the playlist where the music videos are listed. I could go on and on, but this should be sufficient for now. Don't forget to check out our main YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, also which has over 19 playlists by topic as you scroll down our channel page.